quit playing yourself. Hey, yo, quit playing. Hey. Quit, 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 quit playing yourself. Radio UTD. Opinions expressed on Radio UTD are those of the individual expressing them and are not necessarily those of the University Administration, the Board of Regents of the University of Texas System, or of the Operating Board of the Radio Station. For frightful sights and tasty delights, please join the Bass School of Arts, Humanities, and Technology for the Monster Mash. The Monster Mash at the Bass will be hosted on October 31st from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. in the ATEC lobby. For more information, check out at UTD underscore arts on Instagram. Good morning and welcome to the Mercury Morning News, a podcast by students for students to help get your week started. We hope you enjoy. Hey everyone, welcome to the Mercury Morning News. My name is Tyler Beator and I am your volunteer teacher coordinator and PSA manager for Radio UTD. And this morning I am joined by... I am Maria Sheikh, the, U- the, the opinion editor for UTD's Mercury. I'm Fatima Azim, I'm the editor-in-chief for the Mercury. And I am Emily Cool, the station manager at UTD TV. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, today is a bit of a, you know, it's a, it's a heavier day. You know, stuff has been weighing on us in the news, and I'm sure everyone is feeling it. Mm-hmm. But um, today we have brought on Fatima um, to kind of give us a talk about what's going on around the campus and down. Definitely, yeah. So, me. Maria and Jack, our news editor, have been keeping up with kind of the student reaction to the Israel-Hamas war here on campus, which there's been a very strong reaction. Um, We've particularly been keeping up with the Spirit Rocks. This is where a lot of students have been demonstrating at the last couple of weeks. Um, We recently released an article on our website about um, kind of the particular graffiti that people were putting on. And it was really incredible. Um, that rock has been painted over like 15 plus times in the past week and a half with different variations of the Palestinian flag and the Israeli flag. Different students kind of standing in solidarity with these different groups or um, just p- peacefully protesting through graffitiing. We actually have a timeline on our website where we documented all of the different flags and we managed to capture like 11 of those starting from I think it was Wednesday of last week, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, Yeah, I remember the first time I saw it personally was when I was getting out of my chemistry exam at 8 or 9 p.m. on Wednesday, and I saw that the Palestinian flag was on the Spirit Rocks, and then I believe Maria was able to get some photos really early in the morning where um, between a matter of minutes, the the rocks were going between the Palestinian flag and the Israeli flag. Do you want to talk a bit about that? Oh yeah, um, for sure. And just for a bit of context for someone who might know where the spirit rocks are, they're like the big rocks that are usually graffitied um, near Chess Plaza. So like kind of near SSA, SSB, ATEC, that kind of area, they're, like the three rocks that are in the grass. Um, they have been going through the absolute most these past few days. And it's definitely been um, an organized effort, especially on the part of pro-Palestinian um, organizers who kind of want to keep the flag colored Palestine colors and, you know, saying slogans like free Palestine um, from the river to the sea, all that kind of stuff. There's very much been like an organized movement to keep the rock kind of displaying like the, pl- the pro-Palestinian side, which I think is really interesting because you don't normally see that kind of organization around very many things here on campus, I don't think, but it's really awesome. Um, yeah, what Fatima was saying about really early in the morning, I'm not even gonna lie, um, in a lot of the group chats I was in, people were posting pictures of the rocks at like 2, 3 in the morning and they were going between different like designs and it was evident that they were being painted over and there was a turf war happening. Um, a respectful one, like there was no violence or anything like that and groups were able to v- be very civil, which I'm very proud of for us. Uh, but there was very much like this ideological conflict going on at literally 2 in the morning on like a Wednesday night, Thursday morning and I'm like, wow. <laughs> It really speaks to the dedication of the students here to their cause, which I really appreciate. Am I wrong in saying that there was, I, I had heard through the grapevine that there was a um, 
a police officer stationed at the Spirit Rocks to keep it peaceful? So there were actually a couple different police officers there. Um, so police tend to congregate in areas where they see there's a lot of students showing up there, or especially if there's like groups of students with different beliefs and they're aware of what's going on geopolitically, so for safety, the police just wanted to be there. As far as we know, nobody like in particular, like students called them over, um, but they were just kind of there trying to keep peace in case anything broke out, which nothing did, and we're really proud of that. Students really were very civil this whole time. I think Thursday was the day that I saw students being most expressive, so I think that was October 12th or 13th, something like that. Um, we had the rocks going back and forth. Uh, this was the day where one of the rocks, the, the front rock was painted with we are winning on top of the Israeli flag and then um, some people from the pro-Palestinian side, I think it was like a group of 12 to 24 people kind of went back out there, repainted it. Um, and then there were some pro-Israeli painters there as well and they were kind of engaging in some discourse, but it was very respectful, which we're glad for. Um, and then the pro-Palestinian painters were out there for most of the day because um, Students for Justice in Palestine had their poetry night later that evening, so they wanted to make sure that that flag stayed up for like the parents and grandparents that were going to be coming to the plinth so they could be able to see their flag um, going to this poetry night. In a very high-tension situation such as that, I get, like, who's going to stay in that area, you know, their mm -hmm. whole thing is you want to keep the peace, or right. however you say. Um, I'm really glad that um, during that uh, Justice for Palestine um, poetry night, I think that was a beautiful event, and I think that oh, for Palestine sure. flag being on those rocks definitely was, was something that was necessary. And I think that that yeah. event did a lot as well as it did. Definitely, yeah, very fitting for the event, and I agree, it was a beautiful event. Um, I was there doing some coverage that night, actually, and there were over 200 people there, easily. Um, I couldn't even find a place on the plinth to actually sit, and it was really just like a sea of white and black because they were all wearing their kefayas, which is a traditional Palestinian cloth that represents uh, resistance and being tied to the homeland, and there was a lot of people there speaking their poetry, not just from Palestine, but from other places as well. I believe Maria had a friend from Kashmir who also did some poetry. Um, really powerful stuff. I almost cried myself. Um, I'm really glad I got to experience that event. Um, interestingly, on Friday, we called the Dean of Students to ask if there were any like regulations around rock painting because, you know, we did see groups going back and forth. We were wondering, is it all just, you know, up to students to paint these rocks or does do admin ever get involved? Is there ever something that students like can't put on the rocks? And as far as we found out, it's all free game for students, unless they're violating the law, literally, with painting the rocks and doing like actual violence on it, then anything is allowed. I think the only day where there was something that wasn't the Palestinian or Israeli flag was on Saturday. It was Scholars Day. Oh, yeah. yeah. And yeah, it was just painted with the Scholars Day um, stuff for that whole day. But then as <laughs> soon as Scholars Day ended, like the minute it ended. <laughs> yeah, literally. Yeah. Um, from what I understand, Scholars Day lasted until about 2 p.m. or so, and literally on the dot, people showed up and started reworking wow. um, their flag really onto the rocks. Literally, I'm saying. It's genuinely so fascinating how many people were able to come together over these things. And I need to emphasize the amount of collaboration and kind of like the truces going on here as well. For example, during Poetry Night, um, the different groups that were painting the rocks came to an agreement that today, or on that day, the Palestinian flag would stay up in respect and in honor of the SJP Poetry Night. And at one point, I believe you um, know this better than me, Fatima, because you were the one conducting the interview, but there was a kind of, and I quote, three rock solution that was reached between the Israeli and Palestinian groups, where they basically agreed to like, basically, I guess, keep their works on each separate rock or like not encroach on the other's territory, that kind of thing. I'm not sure how long that lasted, but um, <laughs> yeah, armistices, or I guess that's not the correct word, but like truces like that were definitely really common during these past few days. Particularly for that Thursday, because SJP did have their poetry night, and the person I spoke to dubbed it the Three Rock Solution, um, kind of to represent that SJP would have their Palestinian flag on the rocks, and if the pro-Israeli protesters wanted to have something up, they re respectfully requested that they do that on the back rock, so at least that front rock was um, painted with something that represented their event. And then the truce was supposedly like broken. Again, it was an indefinite truce. We don't know how long it's supposed to go on for. I assume like just that Thursday, um, but the next day was 
quote unquote broken. I don't think everyone got the memo. I don't, I don't think everyone was there at the meeting. <laughs> Oh yeah, I mean, we were hardly aware of the meeting. Uh -huh. It was actually really interesting um, to do investigative work for that piece. Do you want to speak on that a little bit, Fatima? Oh, definitely. So, I we originally heard about this three box solution from our advisor, who had heard supposedly from somebody in admin about some type of solution on that Thursday night. So we were really interested in hearing like, what is this? Because that would be really big to know about. So I went to the SJP Poetry Night, as I mentioned, and was interviewing various people. Um, at one point throughout the night, I did have to speak to the police because some of the organizers there were concerned about like safety and things like that, and were not aware kind of of what my press rights were. So I had to speak to the police and kind of explain that. Um, you know, I'm here at this open event, just conducting interview interviews on behalf of the Mercury newspaper, which is our public student-led newspaper, so um, I'm not like a random person off campus trying to sue Discord or something, <laughs> you know, just trying to do my job here. Sue my first, Discord. Yeah, um, my first time having to speak to the police about press rights, which was actually pretty exciting um, and really chill, like the police, you know, perfectly aware of the First Amendment, so I was able to go back into the field and then do my interviews, and then eventually I did get to interview a board member on SJP, and then she's the one who told me a bit more about the Three Rock solution that supposedly some people on the board and some of the pro-Israeli demonstrators, which were not necessarily, as far as we know, were not from a particular group, but were just kind of there on their own accord, had come to some vague solution. <laughs> Um, to make sure that like the flag was up and then she recommended that I speak to other SJP board members but they knew nothing at all from that event so more confusion and then our news editor Jack who I briefly spoke about earlier who's working on the piece with us also was looking around we could find nothing uh, we got we like hit the gold when somebody from SJP ended up speaking to us on drop weekend so as we were putting the newspaper together like at the last moment we were able yeah, to like it was literally yeah. saturday night for reference the mercury wants to be done writing everything and basically be putting things into the paper on saturday night for release on monday morning yeah. it was saturday night we were all huddled in the office having a phone interview with this guy yeah. fatima was conducting it so like respectfully and like with such like composure and cadence meanwhile i was like running around the background like oh my god did you hear what he he said oh my god he gave us so much wonderful information he has yeah. asked to remain anonymous but shout out to our anonymous sjp source for Woo! coming in clutch for that piece yeah it was really uh rewarding being able to conduct that interview this guy like had all the information <laughs> like what we had what we've been observing what different people have been like he said she said type of thing this guy was like an organizer of the, the painting oh, and getting okay that's cool so yeah. he like he was organizing all of the different like hey they took they took down like the palestinian flag let's go put that back up exactly yeah, yeah. Yes. they literally had quote unquote troops like send the troops out boys <laughs> <laughs> yes he was very involved with that organization and was able to speak to a lot of that and how um there were like literally groups of people that were keeping watch of the rocks um going out and painting them um, SJP especially, I think they were the most like outspoken group on campus by far with um, demonstrating through painting these rocks. And he's the one who told us about this three rock solution. Like he was there for that and all of it. Um, so basically it was a solution amongst the people who were there. Um, so I mean, people in SJP knew about it because they had their people there. Right. But when it came to like pro-Israeli protesters, it was between those people specifically and then the people who were there specifically, which is why um, the terminology of the truce being broken, not sure if that's like accurate because like between who, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, but it was so entertaining too because I, Jack, Jack and Maria were like screaming in the back. They were like r walking <laughs> around, and <laughs> I could just see them with their like mouths agape and like <laughs> going into the back room. Like we gotta talk about this while I'm conducting this interview. And yeah, it was a good like 20 to 30 minutes of all of that um, information to really tie together the piece. And what's uh, really cool is CBS reached out to us after this article really? came out. Wait, CBS? Yes, yeah. CBS. What? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so they were on campus. Um, they came on campus late though, because we did the story first. Another Saturday <laughs> night. <laughs> yeah, another. And Saturday they stole night. our timeline photos without credit. No. So way. if you'd love to credit us, 
CBS. I would appreciate that. Oh, actually, that's uh, not true. Oh, they, okay. I gave them permission to use the timeline photos, but they didn't have our credit in it initially. Uh, but then they added it. To they the added it. Oh, good. They edited it in. I was about to go to their headquarters. After yeah, this sending podcast. them a strongly worded email. <laughs> Yeah, but that was pretty cool that CBS was engaged and they had like the little multimedia broadcast to go along with the story and yeah. they were on campus <laughs> like they were literally reporting in front of the visitor center and you can see the visitor center in the back and they found um, they worked quickly. They found two people like immediately that day to speak with some. I they're guess professionals, they're, I guess. Yeah, I, I guess, guess they were like staked out at the rocks because they found like somebody who is painting with the Palestinian flag and then I believe they spoke with a representative from Hillel about um, like pro-Israeli demonstrating there as well um, but yeah that was really cool and then they linked our article so hopefully like more people in the community are viewing that and yeah. becoming more aware about what's going on on campus and we are going to be updating that timeline throughout the week so we actually have taken a few more photos since then um, every time I go to class I'm, I walk by the spirit rocks and I see what's going on pretty much like same deal where it's going back and forth but there was one day where there was a different rock did you guys see like yesterday there was like some halloween thing in the front rock and then there was just like you know israel palestine in the back we weren't here yeah, yesterday emily and i <laughs> were yeah. um gone actually so we Very we didn't gone. get a chance to see it um what was yeah. it you said it was just like a halloween thing yeah, some if some group was, I guess, hosting some type of Halloween event. I think it might have been for Homecoming, actually. Was it for Founders Day, maybe? Because I know Founders okay. Day was yesterday. And That's I know they had, like, the, um, they have the Founder Building, yep. um, like, decked out in, like, decorations. Ooh, wow. Is yeah. that the building where <laughs> there's, like, it says, beware all and bloody handprints on the window. <laughs> what? That yeah, is I so need to get around campus yeah. What are you talking about? I'm not about? seeing any. I've been walking by some buildings where there's like interesting Halloween posters right. on yeah. the windows. I wish a type would do something like that. Like it's like, it seems like everywhere else has <laughs> some kind of... It's just, well, yeah. see, a tech does like things in its lobby. Like there's a new like a... Maybe lat- over the weekend. It's I like a Latino uh, voice project. Oh, um, no. Down the bottom. No, yeah, they always have something really cool in the lobby. They have like a whole like car, like a whole Porsche at one point, but yeah. Anyways, back. <laughs> we're we're that diverting. Thursday too, where we were doing field work, like I was at the SJP poetry night. Mm-hmm. And Maria was also doing some field work for another interesting story um, with TPUSA and the Gender Center and it was kind of implied that the Gender Center was hosting this event. But yeah, I can elaborate that yeah. on that after we talk about the what you were gonna start on. Oh, what was I going to start on? The CBS and then Spirit Rocks. Uh, we can talk a bit about the Benson email as well. Oh, yeah. Like too, I guess that's the next main topic for us. Yeah, for sure. So I can shed a little bit of context on that. So Maria, if I can stop you, you know, we're we're about to go into the Mercury Morning News Report. Okay. Um, oh, we have about 10 seconds left okay. of airtime before we go into that. So I don't want to get onto a topic. All right. Well, next up is the Benson email. Stay tuned. <laughs> we'll yeah. see you after the ad break. Live from the Mercury newspaper, it's October 22nd. I'm Andre Averion. Homefest took place yesterday afternoon, celebrating an array of students and alumni throughout the event. A farmer's market, vendor's fair, and tailgate were just a few things students got to explore on South Campus before attending the women's volleyball game and a fashion show afterwards. The women's volleyball team secured their seventh win this season against Sol Ross State following an outstanding victory the day before against Howard Payne. Speaking of sports, the University Athletics Department received a new logo and website designs over the week, transitioning to a stronger emphasis on the university's green color. The change comes after the women's soccer team's 14th undefeated streak and after the men's team won their game against East Texas Baptist. Comments are expecting that the gym, merch, and outfit designs will follow the new logo and website design before the basketball season begins November 11th. President Benson of the university is expected to appear for the annual Founders Day celebration October 27th, and he will give a speech as to the future development of the school, including details on the upcoming museum, track and field, and second student union. However, concerns arise after the President Benson's letter to the student body voicing his perspective on the Israel-Hamas conflict overseas, 
which has sparked controversy amongst pro-Palestinian students, which is resulting in many students, quote, flooding the inbox of President Benson, end quote, in retaliation. The mass letter is calling for President Benson to issue an apology to the students and a secondary statement and to divest in military partnership programs UC is involved with, which was touched on last semester with student government. This has been the latest from the Mercury newspaper. Now back to our live program on Radio UTD, the Mercury Morning News, every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. All right, welcome back. Mercury Morning News presented to us by Andre Avarian. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here today. He had an appointment, but we miss him very much. We miss you, Andre. <laughs> Okay, back to what we were talking about. Um, did y'all want to cover the um, Benson email first, or the um, Ella, the Gallerstein Jenner Center, TPA USA, T- TPUSA? Yeah, TPUSA. We'll cover the um, Benson email first, because during the ad break, all of our staff were discussing that, and we're super fired up about it, so let's go. <laughs> yeah. um, so to shed some context, I believe um, earlier this week, um, UTD's president, Richard Benson, sent out an email and also made a post on social media that was basically an address from the president and on behalf of UTD. And the contents of this email were basically him saying that the Israel-Hamas war had, you know, obviously caused all these civilian deaths. And he empathized with the plight of Israeli students on campus and Israeli citizens, like, deaths in, um, you know, the battlefield. And that, you know, if anybody needed anything, here were all of these um, support and counseling services here at UTD. But what was very clear in his email was that he didn't mention Palestinian suffering or Palestinian students or Palestinian civilian deaths, which as of right now, I believe are comparable or even outnumber um, Israel civilians' own deaths. Um, He didn't mention any of that once. His email was very biased in how it spoke exclusively about um, Israeli citizens' suffering. And while obviously their suffering is real and must be remarked upon and must be supported and must be mitigated however possible, him leaving out Palestinians absolutely enraged UTD students, faculty, and alum. If you look on social media, for example, on his LinkedIn or his Instagram where he posted these things, there are hundreds of infuriated comments clearly calling him out for this biased reporting and the mercury was able to write an editorial about how this should change fatima do you want to speak on that yes so as maria said we were also quite upset to see his email um what really stuck out to us is this email came out nine days after october 7th which is when the initial attack happened and you know There is a lot that's been going on in the past nine days. Um, Palestine is experiencing one of the worst humanitarian crises in the Middle East, um, and that has escalated a lot over the nine days. Their electricity was cut off, um, airstrikes were launched into the Gaza Strip. A lot, millions of people are being evacuated currently and were last week as well. Um, So it came off to us very insincere, right? This just kind of vague message about um, we recognize the suffering of Israeli citizens and students that might be affected by this, but no word of um, Palestinian students or people who might have ties to Gaza, which we have a very large um, refugee population here on campus, a large Muslim population, a lot of people clearly with ties to Gaza. If you just look at the membership of SJP, for example, there's literally hundreds of people there. SJP actually put out an Instagram post um, Direct, with a response back to that email and it had over 3,500 likes on that. So over 3,500 people were very enraged by that email and wanted Benson to apologize and all of that. So um, this was just super topical. So we got on writing an editorial immediately. Um, it was me, Jack, our, pin, our news editor, and then Maria that worked on that uh, for a couple of days. So all of our words are in that editorial. Um, do you want to kind of talk about some of the most salient points of that, Maria, that really stood out to you from the piece? Sure. Um, I think a really significant one is that um, that just the general nature of Benson excluding talking about Palestinian civilians kind of reflecting this broader um, U.S. political trend of focusing Israel and excluding Palestinians. 
And I understand that it's a political strategy, like the US is Israel's ally, they come first to us in a political context, but it is absolutely inconscionable to only focus on one set of civilian deaths in a war that is brutal and bloody for everybody. And it's especially egregious for Benson to do this because we have an incredibly high number of Muslim students here on campus, people with personal ties to Gaza, people who um, are really severely affected by what's going on. If you look at the Spirit Rock timeline, you will see that the Rock spent the vast majority of its time, that all three Rocks spent the majority of their time being pro-Israel, you know, displaying the Israel flag, or sorry, no, pro-Palestine, displaying the Palestine flag, and having pro-Palestinian slogans, and having doves for peace, and all of these things. Um, so there is clearly a lot of public support here on, at UTD um, for the Palestinian cause. And for Benson to ignore that flagrantly um, just dismisses what his student body thinks. It flagrantly dismisses the real um, casualties of this war. It is honestly unacceptable. Honestly, if you see um, in the coming days an apology email coming out from him or from his staff, then be a little bit wary of it, I would say, because it's clearly being published under, you know, duress and backlash. And we can't ever be sure how much of Benson's supposed care for Palestinian civilians is a response to the backlash and how much is actually sincere. So, President Benson, do better next time, please. I wanted to add something, too. Um, the middle of his email, I actually like that part quite a bit, um, where he talks about kind of noticing peaceful student demonstrations on campus, charity. Um, we're really proud of our students for being civil with each other despite disagreements. Um, but what we found egregious about that was that a lot of the students that he is speaking about are people with ties to Gaza or people that are demonstrating for the Palestinian cause, which we found to be quite unfair. Um, we have been documenting kind of the student response here on campus for the past week and a half, as we just spoke about earlier in the show. And by far what we found is that um, it was people advocating for the Palestinian cause that were doing most of these demonstrations. So as Maria just mentioned, the Palestinian flag, for example, is up on the Spirit Rocks for the most amount of time because we have students from all across campus coming in, spray painting it at different parts of the day. Um, the largest form of like public demonstration was that SJP Poetry Night where over 200 people did come to it and over $2,000 were raised for children in Palestine. So this also goes back to him talking about charity. In fact, that's the only charity that we could identify happening for something related to this war in the past week and a half, which just makes it more confusing, right? That he would spend specifically exclude these students from his message. And Mario also talked earlier about the student response and on LinkedIn there were just like so many professionals um, up on there talking about how they were disappointed to be UTD students or to have gone to UTD if this is the way that the president is kind of speaking on it. It's, like, it would not have been hard um, to release a message that's just pretty impartial honestly, right? Like extending support to all students that might have ties to Israel or Gaza and just offering impartial support. Um, we were able to kind of compare UTD's response to other universities' responses, and even Southern Methodist University had a pretty decent response. Um, it was very much like, um, we feel for everybody in Gaza, the West Bank, and Israel. Here are resources, um, very like inclusive, and not leaving anybody out, right? But UTD was just like randomly so exclusionary. I, I feel like that's so, out of like character for UTD because this is a very like inclusionary school exactly. like I feel like we have like some of the most diversity like in a school that literally I literally one-to-one one white to Asian student ratio here and yet Benson talks like this is like that's not the case like he doesn't recognize who his students are and who his audience is which is incredibly frustrating yeah and that's why I almost want to think that maybe that wasn't Benson writing the email you know because I feel like Ooh. it's very much a PR team like I think it's very much like someone a, get the ghost writer someone fire it's, them it's gotta be someone above Benson who's writing that email because you know obviously it's a very like um American like po political statement like to exclude Palestinians and like Definitely. include like only Israeli people in that kind of statement especially with he's talking about charity the only charity that we've seen on campus or we can observe has been from the um SJP um charity night or like uh, poetry night um so 
it feels like maybe there's someone above Benson. Maybe the like the email that was put out doesn't even reflect Benson's views. Um, it does seem it has similar wording to other emails I've seen from the UT system, is right. what I will say. So I definitely think there was like some type of collaboration between UT system yeah. leaders. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, Benson does get to decide what he puts out to his yeah. University. It's ultimately yeah. his responsibility and his of reputation course. that is now taking a hit. Mm -hmm. I would like to emphasize that in the past few days, ever since the beginning of the Israel Hamas conflict, we have seen hate crimes against Palestinians here in America. Um, there was one in Chicago, there was a man in Michigan who got arrested because he made terroristic threats against Palestinians. Um, the Chicago incident was with a really young boy also. And for this email to come out in the wake of those hate crimes, his silence, Benson's silence, quite literally justifies the dehumanization of these people. But not treating civilians as people worth mentioning, he is lending credence to this cultural notion that it's okay to hurt Palestinians because of your political views. Yeah, I think there's a there's a whole thing me and my partner had to talk about, and it was if you are not actively humanizing someone, you are dehumanizing them. You are Absolutely. reducing their value as a person. So I don't know. I just want to maintain. You know, we have. You know, we are on air. We are media. We need to maintain at least a air of neutrality between us. Um, so hopefully, you know, I just want uh, ceasefire to happen. You know, we talked. The UN talked about it, um, though we can't speak about it too much because it's not campus news. Mm -hmm. But hopefully, we can get a ceasefire in um, the. Gaza area, and we can provide them that humanitarian relief, the food, the water they have so been lacking, and then maybe we can, fig hopefully something happens and we can stop the bleeding in that area. Right. I do want to say one more thing, if that's alright. Of course. Um, in regards to the email, we're not sure if there will be another email issued or an apology, but as the editorial board, we found it important to call it out. Um, one of the quintessential reasons of journalism is to hold people in power accountable, right? And things don't go unchecked. This is very much a checks and balance type of system. And again, even if an apology isn't issued, the public knows that this was critiqued. It's, it's for the public to see, right? He can see that mm -hmm. people are not happy and we've documented all of that here in this editorial. So it is our way of kind of making sure that people in power are kept in check, even if there isn't something tangible that comes from it. That's always super essential to us as journalists. Yeah, absolutely. I think if we as media are not critiquing those in power, then we let them reign free and we let them get away with anything, do what they want. And I think that's, that's a crime of itself. Right. Yeah, and even us being able to voice our support, it's showing people that, you know, they're not crazy for feeling some type of way about Benson's email. We are the student voice, and it doesn't only, you know, impact the people on top who are criticizing, but it also justifies and empowers the people on the ground level, like us, to be open and outspoken Launch because they know they're not alone. Newspaper. It's October 22nd. Oh. I'm Andre Avera. What is that? Homefest took place yesterday afternoon. Is that the Mercury News we are back with No, it shouldn't be. Okay. There we go. Sorry, we had a bit of a um, technical difficulty. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. All right, but no, I um, I don't know. Like, what were y'all saying before the um, Mercury New Morning News report? Oh part yeah, before two Andre's on? beautiful voice cut me off. <laughs> um, I was basically just saying, what was I saying? Yeah. Um, that having this editorial out and just by extension being media who call out people in power it doesn't just keep the people in power in check but it empowers people on the ground level like us students faculty workers who might feel like they're alone in their thoughts to have a voice to feel empowered to speak out to know that they're not alone yeah absolutely and i think that's the beautiful thing about what we do here at radio and at mercury and at amp and tv we give the students a voice and that's the I think that's all we can do at this point in time. Yeah. It's the most important thing we can do. And I hope that this is a learning point for President Benson or the UT system or um, UTD in general. If they do the ghost writer. Editorial. The ghost writer, yeah. Um, ultimately, we do want it to be like a lesson taken, do better next time. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully they do. And hopefully it's not just a thing where they, you know, this happens again and they release a incredibly biased statement to their university of incredibly diverse people yeah. and then one group feels so isolated and it just feels very exclusionary mm -hmm. but let's go hopefully hopefully this is a learning point 
and it's a turning point for not only, you know, Benson and the university and the UT system, but also students. You know. right. Speaking of turning points, after the second ad break, we are going to move on to Turning Point USA and the Gallerstein Gender Center's um, concurrent events, which I think make a very interesting news story. That was very smooth. <laughs> Good job, yeah. Now we have a second news break coming up in about 20 seconds. So to kind of preview what we will be talking about, um, we're going to talk about Turning Point USA. Uh, and then I believe um, I'm here to speak about our Valorant esports team coming back with their Red Bull Campus Clutch qualifiers. Ooh, exciting. Yeah. Um, we will see you after the break. We are back with Dallas Formula Racing's biannual event, Cars and Comets. There will be a variety of cars, from muscle, Japanese domestic market, and exotic supercars. This will be an event you don't want to miss. The event will be on October 27th, from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., on the top floor of the parking structure next to ECS West. For more information and to follow Dallas Formula Racing, follow them at Dallas Formula Racing on Instagram. That's at Dallas Formula Racing on Instagram. Get your engine and gear comments, and we'll see you there. Live from the Mercury newspaper, it's October 22nd. I'm Andre Averion. Homefest took place yesterday afternoon, celebrating an array of students and alumni throughout the event. A farmer's market, vendor's fair, and tailgate were just a few things students got to explore on South Campus before attending the women's volleyball game and a fashion show afterwards. The women's volleyball team secured their seventh win, this season against Sol Ross State, following an outstanding victory the day before against Howard Payne. Speaking of sports, the University Athletics Department received a new logo and website designs over the week, transitioning to a stronger emphasis on the university's green color. The change comes after the women's soccer team's 14th undefeated streak and after the men's team won their game against East Texas Baptist. Comments are expecting that the gym, merch, and outfit designs will follow the new logo and website design before the basketball season begins November 11th. President Benson of the university is expected to appear for the annual Founders Day celebration October 27th, and he will give a speech as to the future development of the school, including details on the upcoming museum, track and field, and second student union. However, concerns arise after President Benson's letter to the student body voicing his perspective on the Israel-Hamas conflict overseas, which has sparked controversy amongst pro-Palestinian students, which is resulting in many students, quote, flooding the inbox of President Benson, end quote, in retaliation. The mass letter is calling for President Benson to issue an apology to the students and a secondary statement and to divest in military partnership programs UC is involved with, which was touched on last semester with student government. This has been the latest from the Mercury newspaper. Now back to our live program on Radio UTD, the Mercury Morning News, every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. All right, welcome back to Mercury Morning News. <sighs> Bit of a he few heavy topics earlier today. Yeah, but. on to more lighthearted things. Yeah. So for, um, we're going to make this one quick and easy for y'all. So basically for context, Turning Point USA is a very conservative organization that operates on college campuses. They bring in conservative speakers with views that are generally, you know, anti-LGBT and all this kind of stuff. So um, recently, I think it was um, last Thursday, actually, th TPUSA invited Riley Gaines to come speak at UTD. Riley Gaines is most known for um, being an outspoken activist against transgender women competing in sports. She's known for um, tying with transgender swimmer Leah Thomas in a race. And ever since then, she's kind of been in the media doing like the college like speaking circuit, that kind of thing. Recently, I think she's been on tour specifically, and that's why TPUSA was able to invite her. But basically, they invited her to talk about her life story, her experiences, and why she thinks that transgender women shouldn't be able to compete in women's sports. And at the same time as this event was going on, the Gallerstein Gender Center, which UTD runs, organized an event, which they didn't explicitly say was related to the TPUSA event, but it was an event focused on, quote, celebrating Leah Thomas. 
and it was basically um we had food, we had snacks, we went there and we watched interviews that Leah and other transgender activists gave to um, kind of, I guess, be out of the way of the Riley event. Fatima was able to go to the Riley event and I was able to go to the Leah event. And while it was pretty clear that um, the gender center didn't want any kind of like explicit association between Leah Thomas and Riley Gaines in terms of the two events, it was kind of obvious from the general population of people who went to the Gender Center's event that they were there to escape the whole like Riley Gaines thing happening on campus. Do you have any um do you have anything you want to say about the Riley event, Fatima? Sure. So I wasn't there for the full speech itself. I had a coworker go there while I was at the SJP Poetry Night. We got all these things happening on the same night. But I was able to be there afterwards. Um, my coworker sent me like all of his notes and interviewed somebody from TPUSA. I believe it was their outreach coordinator about um, kind of the event, bringing Riley Gaines onto campus. Particularly interested in why bring her on at this time. Like. Is this connected to maybe what's going on more nationally in politics for y'all to bring her on at this particular point in time? Um, they didn't really have, they didn't like really confirm that it was because of national politics or anything, but rather that she was free during this time. That's why they brought her as the conservative speaker for the semester. And I asked some questions about kind of this event in relation to the Gender Center event, because that was not only happening in the same day, but the same time. So this was at 7 p.m. and then this gender center event was also happening at 7 that thursday night was so crazy the sjp event the riley event oh and the leah event were all happening at Holy 7 p.m at the same time yeah. the mercury was <laughs> running itself ragged trying to do everything that week was crazy uh, how many reporters did you have out in the field during that night oh so it was me at the sjp poetry night event unfortunately jack was sick that day so oh. he was operating kind of from home sure. trying to help us virtually I had a photographer there, so I was kind of between there and the TPUSA event, sure. and then we had uh, Maria at the Gender Center event, which once you get in, you can't really get out, so she was kind of observing it from what I take, mm -hmm. and then... Um, but once you get in, you can't get out. It was so wild, actually. At the Gender event, they specifically had this big monologue in the beginning about how, I know some people here are from student media, but I hope you're here in your student capacity and not in your media capacity. They were generally pretty unresponsive to interview requests over email and that kind of stuff so they very clearly didn't want to give any kind of impression that this event specifically was supposed to be like a counter event or a response event or some kind of it seemed pretty you know obvious that it was. oh yeah i conducted some interviews with some people at the event after the event of course i didn't violate what they asked of me after the event i was able to talk to some people and i generally got the impression that everyone knew that this event was happening in response to the tpusa inviting riley Gaines to campus and that they were actually really thankful for a safe space to go where LGBT people could be honored and respected in um, a campus culture that might not be so welcoming to them at the moment. It feels very weird that they wouldn't be like responsive to interviews or anything of that sort. Like, yeah. I feel like they're, I would like love to like, if they, you're hosting a counter event, like even don't say, you know, don't say it's a counter event, but like- Share your side yeah. of like what you think. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Kind of the theme for Thursday was evasiveness to the press. Yeah. It's <laughs> like every group that we try to talk with, honestly. Um, not that that's necessarily press censorship, but... I yeah, you have the right to not want to talk right. to the press, but we also have the right to ask and, like, you know, if we don't get good information, then we can only report what we know, and right. if that ends up being right. incorrect, you can't hold us accountable for it. And well, does your name have to be attached to it? Can some people just be anonymous even if they want to speak on it? So typically, you have to have your name on it. The only person who can grant anonymity at the paper is me, and I only grant anonymity for a couple of reasons. Number one, the person's life is is in danger or they could be at financial risk if their name is associated with the article or they are an essential source they have like all of the information but they're requesting anonymity and we will not have any information for the story we're going to give it to them which was in the case of um the sjp member that had like all the information um for the spirit rock story um but we did run it was very interesting i don't think i've ever spoken to so many people at once that were telling me i can't do my job like, you're not allowed to interview, You can. I'm not going to let you speak to people, that type of thing. So it was a very interesting um, kind of professional learning experience and how do you handle that as a journalist when you are in your, uh, within your rights, you're in a public space trying to interview somebody, but 
people are telling you that you can't interview other people, well, it's up to that person, right? If somebody willingly wants to give me their name and interview with me, I can't just, I'm not just going to decline that because they told me. No, I will go talk to them, actually. Yeah, but it's also a matter of handling it diplomatically because yeah. you do ultimately want to get an interview with that person, mm -hmm. have their story heard, but if they're very, like, antsy, then you're not going to get that if you just... Um, kind of spit in their face and say, well, I have a right as press to be here, then they're not going to talk to you at right. all. For sure, yeah. It's the responsibility of the press to do everything we possibly can to secure an interview and to secure the correct information, but when we keep running into like roadblock after roadblock, people left and right telling us, you can't be here, you can't interview here, you need to leave, or you need to be here in your student capacity and not be here in your media capacity, it's a little hard to do our jobs. Oh, yeah, for sure. And I, I think I want to say you both did a wonderful job like reading the articles that you've written in the um, editorial that you got out and all of these um, p me pieces of media where you were like not censored but you were denied interviews and you were denied all of this um, press coverage that and you did you still did a fantastic and job and also you're, you're, you're doing this for the students you're doing this yeah, for the we, people who you know want to be heard but can't like you know go speak to you know Benson or you're telling you know you're showing you know maybe what they don't want you <laughs> they don't, like the uppers don't want you to know and you know you're helping out a lot of people by even just trying so we thank you we appreciate you guys we have to be as diligent as possible. Um, if somebody doesn't interview with you, you gotta find the next person, or yeah. you gotta try to work it out with that person. If they have really important information or a really great story, that would be wonderful for the public to hear. Yeah, and I think I think that's the thing with a lot of um, our people like on campus right now. You know, they ha they all have incredible stories that we want to share, especially at that SJP event. Like, and I think the poetry was like evident in uh, in that like even if they didn't want to interview with you you got to hear their story through their poetry and i think that's what's beautiful about it but um you know hopefully um our students on campus and other campus resources will see the necessity of media and kind of follow in that and maybe maybe they'll be more open to speaking with press and be more open because we are on their side we are on the side of freedom of speech and the press and the media and we want to share the voices of those who cannot share it themselves. Right. We're on the side of truth, and the truth is revealed through stories. So we hope that as we continue to do truthful reporting, accurate reporting, um, more people will be open to interviews. I mean, we've already seen it. Like, a lot of people reach out to us with their stories, um, yeah. wanting us to look into different things. I think that's a good sign of the public having trust in media, which is so important. Yeah. Um, in a lot of, like, corporate media associations, there's... I mean, we all hear it like, we don't trust the media, all of this stuff. So it's really nice to hear on campus that um, we do get quite a few students that reach out to us because it, it seems like they trust us with their stories or they want us to look into different things because they've seen that we do impartial reporting or that we do our due diligence and we do try to report. So um, that's definitely something that I hope we continue to foster is the campus trust in us and that we continue to be truth seekers and keep trying to get the story no matter who tries to feed us. <laughs> no matter who tries to evade us yeah, yeah mercury mercury starts a you. track team they start running people down no mer literally mer mercury slogan we will find you <laughs> oh my gosh. we, will find, we will find you and we will interview you <laughs> no matter what <laughs> Um, well, in our last two minutes, I just want to touch on the Valorant story. Um, yeah, our Red, our UTD Esports Valorant team actually placed first in the Red Bull Campus Clutch Tournament Qualifiers for the Red River region. Um, they are an incredible team. Um, they still have a lot of growing to do, you know. They might have won first in their qualifier for the regional event, but they went to the regional event, you know, it was placed in San Antonio. Um, the Red River region includes over 30 Texas and Oklahoma universities. Um, they did unfortunately only place third out of four teams at the October 7th offline tournament. You know, they lost to Texas A&M, University Maroon in first, and University of St. Thomas Esports in second. Um, Ethan, Ethan Van, a computer engineering sophomore and the team manager, said the team was prepared for the competition. You know, they prepared through weekly scrimmages and VOD reviews, but unfortunately it just wasn't enough to kind of get through that team. Um, they actually beat, you know, the Texas A&M team at the qualifier, but I think, you know, when they got into that offline tournament, things were just, it was a whole different ball game. 
Um, but you know that we can see from the report that um, Henry Galvez did that you know they, this team is ready. They're gonna they're gonna keep training and they're gonna be ready for the next event. They're training their butts off and they are going to be participating in weekly tournament matches organized by the North America Division of One Esports. Um, it's still the team's still relatively new. You know, it's only it came into it came into being um, last semester. You know, o sorry, not last semester, last year, October of 2022. Wow, um, that's recent. Yeah, right. They're already doing so good to get to the qualifiers and through them. Yeah, they're a top competitor in our Texas esports. Bum said ramping up practices and the amount of time spent together could allow the team to climb even higher. But that is what we have for our. Mercury Morning News for 1022. We hope that you'll come back and talk with us again on October 29th, if I know how to do math, at 10 a.m. <laughs> um, we'll be putting out um, media event uh, media about who is going to be on that closer to the actual date. Um, but for now, this has been Tyler Viator, Maria Sheikh, Fatima Zim, and Emily Cool. Signing off. Thank you and enjoy the new music.
So. 